Good evening, friends. Welcome to the Cargill United Methodist Church, where this evening we have planned a conversation called Somewhere Under the Rainbow, a faithful conversation about LGBTQ plus justice. Yesterday morning in our fellowship hall after work, after church, rather, one of our wonderful young people, she's nine years old, she saw the flyers for this event, and she insisted that we got it wrong. Mom, it's somewhere over the rainbow. No, no. That's what you get when you try to be clever. As many of you know, before I became a pastor, I was a journalist, and for five years I was a religion writer for Knight Ritter newspapers based in St. Paul, Minnesota at the Pioneer Press. And just about 20 plus years ago, I interviewed the Reverend Mark Hansen, who at the time was the presiding bishop of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America that we know as the ELCA. For example, First Lutheran, our neighbors just across uh, Milwaukee Street, is an ELCA congregation. The ELCA was going through many of the same challenges that the United Methodist Church has been going through, particularly in these last three years. They, in fact, are among many mainline Protestant denominations in this country who have gone the path of discerning their faithful response to issues in society and culture. And so anyway, Mark Hansen was the presiding bishop. We don't have that position in the United Methodist Church. We don't have one overall bishop. The ELCA does. And he was from St. Paul, and so I talked to him about what it was like to lead a church through his, this process. And he said what he would always do when he went to spoke at a congregation in settings just like this one, maybe 40, 60, 80, 100 people, he would always ask them, so first I want to see a show of hands. How many of you growing up had healthy conversations about sexuality in your homes? And judging by your response... I see that you are perhaps resonating with what he found. Not very many people raised their hands. And then he would ask the questions, how many of you have experienced positive conversations about sexuality in your church? And he said inevitably, every time he was in a group of about 100 people, two people would raise their hands. And his point was, that how do we have difficult conversations when we can't have positive and healthy conversations when we're not even facing challenge? Now, just because we don't talk about things in public doesn't mean we don't talk about them. We just tend to talk about them in private. In church, I tend to call these parking lot conversations. I'm sure you've had them. I've had them. Among other things, parking lot conversations are ones that the pastor usually doesn't hear about. You know, you have a meeting with a group, you're talking about the new paint or the new carpet, and only a few people speak up in the meeting, but then on the way out, everybody's talking about it in the parking lot. In the business world, this is called uh, an offline conversation. And there's nothing wrong with offline conversations. In fact, some conversations should take place among a few people. And it is often a way for introverts to feel more comfortable than speaking up at a meeting. And I am pretty sure that the Holy Spirit is still present in the parking lot, so that's not to say that good ideas and, and good decisions can come out of private conversations. But... Parking lot conversations can also lead to factions. It can make it easier to talk about someone rather than with someone. In Philippians 4, 2 through 9, Paul's letter, he talks about two prominent women in the church, Euodia and Syntyche. And they had a disagreement that was so severe and public that the entire church knew about it. No parking lot conversation here. Everybody was aware of the conflict. And so word reached the Apostle Paul. And these women had once been ministry partners, but now they sat on opposite sides of the table. And they couldn't resolve their concerns on their own, so Paul employed a third party to their aid. 
Today we might call that a mediator. He called this person a trusted companion. And far from changing the subject or taking it out into the parking lot, as it were, he coached his companion, mentor, mediator over the next few verses of this passage on the process of mediation and reconciliation, providing steps to resolution. So Euodia and Sintashi, they had this volatile conversation, uh, or situation rather, that provoked pen to Paul to pen this beautiful passage of Scripture saturated with both the peace of God and the God of peace. So what does this Scripture say? Well, among other things, when the floor drops out from under you, when your best friend hates you, when rumors multiply, when people misunderstand you, when the world seems mixed up, Paul writes, rejoice in the Lord always. That's always his starting point and his ending point. Secondly, he says, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Now I can tell you, I have a lot of friends on Facebook and they let a lot of things be known to everyone, but it's not always their reasonableness. Paul says as Christians, we should be the most open and teachable people out there. Or as Matthew says in the gospel, Matthew 7, 3, he says, take the plank, the log out of your own eye before you try to take the speck out of your neighbor's, right? And then Paul writes, don't be anxious about the conflict, but ask God to resolve it. You know, most of us fear conflict and confrontation. Our heart rates pulses, our, our body trembles. We might be quick to seek human counsel to figure out our conflicts. We may find people who, who will corroborate our side of the story because we like being right and we like surrounding ourselves with people who agree with us. But Paul says we're to cast our anxiety on God. To ask God to do the impossible things that we haven't figured out. So if there be anxiety among you just by the very nature of this conversation, let us cast it upon God. I tell you what, the more complex the world seems to get, or maybe it's just the older I get, I am increasingly thankful that God is God and I am not. It takes a lot of pressure off. So the question about how the church is to be called in ministry with people of various sexual orientations and gender identities has often been a parking lot conversation. And so the prayerful intent of this evening is to have a conversation in each other's presence. The kind of healthy conversation that when Bishop Hansen asked the question, he found it to be so rare in churches. You know, it's all too easy for churches, maybe just in our human nature, to have conversations about people rather than with, with people. Imagine planning youth ministry or children's ministry and never having spent any time with children or youth. And you know what? Sometimes the church does that. Right? Or imagine if Cargill UMC says that we want to have a meaningful conversation about racial relations, but there is no cross racial, multicultural presence in the room. We're talking about people, but not with people, right? Imagine having a conversation about gay, lesbian, transgender persons, but never having genuinely befriended someone for whom that is their life, their reality. And too often, that's what the church has done. Now you notice an empty chair on either side of me here. Ideally, this would be a conversation. It would be a dialogue more than a monologue. And there would be people with us this evening who represented gender and orientation identities that would be different than mine. But you see, that's a brave ask. Oh, I could have found some 
activist person who's really comfortable being in the public spotlight, somebody from Madison or Milwaukee maybe, and we could have come and we could have had the presentation. But, but this is about us. And you see, I don't know. Someone told me years ago that as a, as a pastor or as a discussion leader, I can't declare to you this is a safe space. Because the only ones who can make this a safe space is all of us, isn't it? And so whether you're a racial minority or you're gay or lesbian or transgender, I can't say to someone whom we do not have a trusting relationship, oh, this is a safe space, will you come? Now in my heart of hearts, I believe that the Cargill United Methodist Church is a safe space. And if I didn't, we wouldn't be having this conversation. As Paul says in his letter to the Romans, therefore welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Doesn't it sound so simple? And I trust that we in this church believe that. But each of us, including we as pastors, need to catch ourselves when we respond to the stranger or the foreigner or the unknown traveler who is different at us with a subtly questioning posture. And sometimes we do it innocuously and we don't notice. Did you see that woman with all the tattoos who was in church on Sunday? Well, even if we have meant no disrespect, we have othered her. Yeah, he's the one who's disabled, we might say. And We have then identified him by some adjective about his physical attributes. And so we have othered him. Is it a safe space for him? We want more young families in our church, we say, and yet when they are here with their children, someone looks askance at them because they don't think they're behaving the way we think they ought to behave. And so we have othered them. Othering is viewing or treating a person or a group of people as intrinsically different from one itself, from oneself. And of course, we're all different, right? And some of it might seem harmless. He's the tallest person in his class. I love your pink hair. And some of us are comfortable and proud of our individuality and our uniqueness. But when the chairs around us are empty because we have unwittingly communicated that you may not be welcome, or more to the point, because we've not have, we have not explicitly welcomed you, we have othered to the detriment of the gospel. And I truly believe that most people in most churches that I have been a part in my life have not done this intentionally. Sometimes we just do it because we don't realize what it's like to be someone who's not ourselves. You could argue that the first case of othering in the Bible occurred between those famous brothers in in Genesis, Cain and Abel. You can read from Genesis 4 that there was this notion of religious conflict that arose between the brothers about how they each worshipped God. And you know how that story came out? Ended up in murder, didn't it? So that's extreme othering. Later in Scripture, also in Genesis, after the flood, what happens? Humans begin to multiply on the earth, and the differences among them are more openly depicted, and so people become separated into different lands and different languages and different families and different nations. And there's nothing inherently wrong with those distinctions, those divisions. And yet, through human nature, look at the conflict that has come about because of the ways we other. So why are we speaking this evening specifically about sexual orientation and gender identity, about people whose identity is lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, questioning, queer, however they identify themselves? Well, we could be having a conversation about all sorts of people who we perceive as others. But 
because we are a part of a denomination called the United Methodist Church, which has, at last, concluded that it cannot live together over its differences of interpretation about scripture and tradition and reason and experience. This issue is before us whether or not we invited it, and perhaps it is good that it is before us. I want to clarify that we are beyond a point of a decision about whether or not this church will remain in the United Methodist Church because it will. The briefest of summaries about this entire history of the United Methodist Church in this area, I will not, I will not offer a detailed summary because we might be here until September. But the Reverend Brianna Elaine of the Wisconsin Council of Churches shared with the council this last week a brief synopsis, and I'm going to make it even briefer. I mentioned earlier that the United Methodist Church has come to this, this time in its history later than a lot of the other U.S. denominations. And the reason is largely because we are truly a global church. The Evangelical Church in America, the ELCA, is a church largely in the United States. The Episcopal Church USA is largely a church that's in the USA. The United Methodist is global. Uh, we have uh, churches in Africa, East Asia, Central Europe. And so we gather every four years for our general conference, which is the group that makes decisions for the church. You can imagine the multitude of theologies and cultures and contexts that come together in the United Methodist Church. And so it has taken longer for us to come to a place of, of decision. There is language that's been in the United Methodist Book of Discipline, which is our, our, our denominational guidebook, our rules, so to speak, since 1972. They've evolved. Essentially, they forbid practicing homosexuals from ordination and marriage in the church. You can even hear in the wording that it is rather old-fashioned and archaic and not the language with which we describe people today. But as you can imagine, in a global church, there's a great amount of difference in how we interpret that and where we think that the church should be reflecting where we are as a society, as a culture, as people. And ultimately... The United Methodist Church sought to come together in 2019 in a specially called General Conference in St. Louis, Missouri with the hope and prayer of finally coming to some resolution. And what happened is that finally the nail on the coffin of any hope for the United Methodist Church remaining together in unity was sealed shut because we realized just how deeply divided the global church was. And so eventually they set forth a path by which churches could disaffiliate the, with, from the denomination while keeping their property intact. And there was a window of time, and that's the window that was opened and is now closing. And as a result of it, in the denomination, approximately 20% of the congregations throughout the entire United Methodist Church voted to disaffiliate. In Wisconsin, is about 10%. 43 United Methodist congregations in Wisconsin voted to disaffiliate and we had 440 congregations. So I'm not a math major, but that's about as close to 10% as you can get. Some of the churches will join the Global Methodist Church, which was a new denomination that was created specifically to draw away churches from the United Methodist Church. Some of them will become non-denominational. Others may affiliate with other denominations, and others may simply wait and see. So as we sit here today, we are the Cargill United Methodist Church. We and 400 other congregations in Wisconsin and thousands of them throughout the denomination in this country and around the world remain UMC. But there is not a period at the end of the sentence. There is at best an ellipsis and truthfully new chapters to write. There's still the language in the book of discipline that ironically the departing churches wished to have there and they have now left. 
And so at our next general conference, there will be the matter of whether we will continue to, to singularly isolate one group of persons because gay, lesbian, transgender persons are the only ones that our Book of Discipline has ever mentioned by any specific identity for any pro, uh, prohibitive sort of life in the church. There, of course, has been harm caused to LGBTQ plus people whose lives have been talked about as an issue rather than in relationships, and many of those relationships have been broken. And simply, many people have simply left the church because of that. Now, some questions frequently arise when congregations speak about these matters. I guess you could call these frequently asked questions. And one of the questions is, is frequently this. Why is the church changing its theology and beliefs to fit in for the society today? And so that understanding says, well, you know, the Bible is clear and unchanging, and why are we just changing the rules because it's in vogue today for people to have this expression or this expression or another? This isn't my study Bible. I should have brought it in. I have a big, thick study Bible. I can't even put it in a backpack. It's too big and thick and heavy. And I have notes written all over that book. I am not going to pretend that I'm a Bible scholar. I'm not going to get a job preaching at Princeton. But my ministry and the life of our church is formed around Scripture, which is foundational and shapes all that we do. So I don't speak as a biblical professor, but I speak as a practitioner of the faith who, who believes that the scripture is our foundation. And I believe we have always interpreted the Bible from the outset. Two centuries ago in this country, the New Testament was used to justify slavery and it was used to condemn slavery. And presumably it was the same words of the text. We have always had to interpret Scripture. There are lots of things that the Bible says that we have interpreted and reinterpreted over time. In Deuteronomy 22, in the Old Testament, if it is discovered that a bride is not a virgin, then the Bible demands that she be executed by stoning immediately. Later in the same book, if a married person has sex with someone else's husband or wife, the Bible commands that both adulterers be stoned to death. The New Testament speaks rather pointedly about divorce, far more than it makes any comment about the nature of marriage or the relationships among genders. And while we would never say, oh, Divorce is no big deal because that's not our theological understanding as well. We have, as people of faith, struggled to discern and find a way that we can continue to relate to one another by joining our scriptural beliefs and our human understanding. Does that make sense? Why does the church change its theologies and beliefs to fit society today? Think about the advances in health care in the last 50 years. Think away about the ways that the scripture often talks about illness, particularly mental illness. How it talked about demonization. Now we can get hung up on what the Bible was talking about when it was talking about demonization and we might say today, well today we would have a diagnosis with that. But you see the point isn't about the specific language of the demonization. The point of the story is, is that what people are believed to be demonized then or if people have been uh, diagnosed with mental illness now, what is, the, what is the, the similarity? That they are often disenfranchised and pushed to the side. So the biblical truth underneath it depends, in this case, on the advancements of medicine that understands the human condition that doesn't invalidate Scripture. Is this, is this finding a home at all? And you're hearing that it requires us to look anew at the world. 
In 1610, the astronomer Galileo published his observations that promoted the theory of heliocentrism. Anybody know what that is? The earth revolves around the sun as well as all the other planets. Well, until then, now he actually followed up on Copernicus's work about 100 years earlier, but when Galileo said that, which would not be controversial today, would it? Would it be controversial today if I were to say that I believe that the earth and the planets rotate around the sun? He was excommunicated as a heretic. And he continued his scientific, he was excommunicated in 1616. He continued his scientific work. Among them, he discovered that the movement of the tides was actually evidence that the earth was in motion in the pattern that it was. And in 1633, he was condemned by the Inquisition and sentenced to house arrest until he died. I bring this up not to make fun of the church or of Galileo, but to simply say that throughout the history of faith, throughout the history of God's people, we have grappled with new information and new realities and new discoveries, and we have not jettisoned our Holy Scripture. In fact, in many ways, we have leaned in even closer to our Holy Scripture as we see the mysteries of God revealed. I've often thought that when we have conflicts between religion and science and sometimes when our youth start to, for the very first time to be taught about the theories of evolution or whatever and it sometimes it causes an, an epistemological crisis because all of a sudden it doesn't go with what, what they have been taught in Sunday school and, and what I've often always tried to convey is our faith answers some questions and science answers other questions, but I don't believe that if God created the world that science would discover something that God had not already created. We may understand things about God's creation that are different from when the scriptures were written 1,800 years ago, but I can't believe that science would reveal something to us that would be contrary to the nature of God's creation in the first place. There's something else about United Methodism, and this is also uh, uh, something that comes up quite often. You know, language changes. Yesterday I joked that we sang a song from our United Methodist hymnal called Seek Ye First. For most of us in this room, that song's been around a long time. It's in our United Methodist hymnal, which was printed in 1989. I remember when that was a brand new song. Now it's a traditional song, right? If you sing a praise song in church that was written in 2011, that's an old song. So words change. What does traditional mean? There's been a lot of talk in this ongoing controversy in the United Methodist Church about returning to traditional Methodist values. And I'm offering this as objectively as I possibly can. This is traditional Methodism. Traditional Methodism is what is often called the Wesleyan quadrilateral, although he didn't coin the word. A professor at Southern Methodist University who was a Wesley historian coined the word in the 1960s. But the essence is that how do we navigate the world as United Methodists? Scripture is primary. It is the source. It is the guide for the light that sheds understanding in our lives. And we, we interpret Scripture through the lens of tradition and reason and experience. Which means that in our history, quite plain and simply, we are not biblical literists. Does that mean that the Bible is not true? Yes, the Bible is true. The Bible is true in every level of grammar and meaning, but we are not biblical literists. The example I often use in confirmation classes, if I said, the sun fell into the ocean in west in an amazing array of color, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? I'm talking about a sunset. But did the sun literally fall into the ocean? Of course not. Both statements are true. Do you see how they're true on different levels? So, as United Methodists, we don't dispatch Scripture when we come upon new information. We go back to Scripture and we search for the deeper meanings as our tradition, the history of the church, as reason, what our intellect and what science might show, and our human experience. Because our human experience can vary 
vastly differently, can't they? If someone in this room was born into a wealthy neighborhood in, in, in Whitefish Bay, Wisconsin, to the, as the child of a, of a, of a doctor, uh, you may have had economic advantages that a child born six miles to the south would not have had as a young person of color. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with one or the other. The question is that our experience is differently. And human experience is vastly different throughout the Bible. So, traditional Methodism grounds ourselves in Scripture, but we validate tradition, reason, and experience. Here's why I think this is so important. And I want to say this. this is, I'm going to say this important thing before I say the other important thing. For the most part, we are who the church has taught us to be. I'm 62 years old. I was born in 1960. My first formative uh, experiences in the church were probably in, when I was eight or nine and continued to be active in the church. I am who that church taught me to be. My church wasn't talking about what it meant to be gay in 1972. I lived in Lily White, Eau Claire, Wisconsin. My church wasn't talking about racial reconciliation when I was growing up in the church. I wasn't raised conservative. I was raised traditional. That way I was raised in a faith that didn't ask a whole lot of questions beyond the walls of the church. I am who the church taught me to be. In my adulthood, I, of course, have encountered many people who were unlike people with whom I grew up, and they have changed my lives in many profound and spiritual ways. There are people who, in this congregation, would not have thought to come to worship without a suit and a tie or a dress and a hat. Am I right? I know the history of this church. I know the history of the churches everywhere, right? We are who we are enculturated to be. And so there's no stones being cast. But here's why I mentioned the quadrilateral. We know that objectively there have been scientific and psychological understandings about gender identity and sexual orientation that we simply did not know of 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago when the church was teaching us, if they spoke of it at all, about sexual identity. Gender orientation. We didn't talk about it. We didn't know. Now, do we accept science? Do we accept the overwhelming preponderance of evidence from the psychological community? The people are who they are, and they don't choose to be one thing or another. It doesn't mean that we would all have agencies of choice. How do we reconcile that with what we learned in a Bible study when we were 24 that taught us because we had been taught to believe that this is what marriage is and this is what it means to be a human and how do we reconcile that? I believe that as traditional Methodists, we are partners with the psychological, medical, and scientific communities. I'm not going to get into a deeply detailed conversation about all of that. But if I'm sitting with someone here or someone here with an orientation and an experience and understanding that's different than mine, I'm going to listen and when they tell me this isn't a choice I made, this is who I am, well, I have a choice then. I can debate. I can tolerate. I can converse. And I can love. It's taken me a while to realize that I don't have to understand everything in order for it to be so. My wife will attest to the fact that it's sometimes hard for me because I want to understand everything. But I can tell you what, I can't possibly understand everything that each of you have gone through because it's your experience. 
So at some point I have to be humble enough to say, God made you, God loves you, and so I will too. One of the other questions that often comes about is, well, what about what the Bible says about homosexuality? Now, I am also not going to get into a detailed hermeneutical interpretive conversation because that even sounded like something you don't want to do, right? Um, These conversations have been held since, in the United Methodist Church, the answer to this question started in earnest in the early 1960s. I am happy, actually privileged as your pastor to have a detailed conversation about this if you want to have a detailed conversation about it, but I'm not going to speak about it in detail this evening. What I can say is this, that there are six or perhaps seven references in the Bible, depending on how you count it, that Christians have used to say that homosexuality is wrong. There's Noah and Ham in Genesis 9. There's Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19. There are Levitical laws that condemn same-sex relationships in Leviticus 18. There are two words and lists of vices that are in the second, uh, the New Testament in 1 Corinthians and in 1 Timothy, and then Paul's letter to the Romans in Romans 1. Here is what biblical scholars from various sides of the aisle in various interpretations have come to believe that the incidences that are spoken about in in, in Scripture do not refer to same-gender relationships between two loving, committed people because such a thing did not exist at the time of Scripture. That doesn't mean that those passages don't have meaning along with the rest of Scripture. Genesis 9 and 19 are describing rape or attended rape. Leviticus 18 is talking about cultic prostitution. 1 Corinthians is talking about male prostitution and pederasty. And Romans 1 is talking about a non-Christian cult in Rome. I had an opportunity to speak to the United Women of Faith. No, actually, no, I'm sorry. It was a Bible study that was held in the church, one of our weekday Bible studies uh, some time ago. And we were talking about this very thing. And their question to me is, well, what does the Bible say about immorality? I mean, the Bible has something to say about immorality, right? And I said it does. Sexual immorality in the Old Testament is defined from the Greek word porneia, What does porneia sound like to you? Pornography, it's the same word. And sexual immorality in the Bible is incest, prostitution, and unfaithfulness. And unfaithfulness in this sense is the meaning of unfaithful is turning to other gods. And so our understanding, when the Bible talks about sexuality and human relationships, is that the Bible in the Older Testament was talking about one person or a group of persons who took advantage of another. Same gender sexual relationships in the Older Testament were by definition a sense of abuse of one person taking advantage of another because it was usually men taking advantage of little boys or it was cultic worship that turned women into cultic prostitution as part of the religious practices. Again, I could talk much more about the biblical interpretation. I shared with that Bible study that one day they said, so if that's what immorality is, then how do you define morality? And I said, morality is right living. What's right living, pastor? Well, as United Methodists, I can tell you what right living has been. The three basic rules of being a United Methodist Church, one, do no harm, two, do good, and three, stay in love with God, attending upon the ordinances, which is the sacrament of worship and prayer. I realize that I'm, in the interest of time, making all of this seem rather simplistic because any one of these things, as I mentioned, I would privilege to to talk about in further detail. There's something else that I have recognized. I came into ministry part-time in 2008, full-time in 2010. And as I entered into a ministry, there were lots of things I was fearful of. 
I wasn't sure I was going to be able to preach every week. I didn't know if I was going to be able to interpret the Bible well enough. I didn't know if I would understand church finances enough so that my churches could succeed. I didn't know if I could counsel people or do a funeral. There was a lot of things that I worried about as I became a pastor. I did not anticipate the single biggest challenge that I have experienced in my ministry from 2010 until today, which is ministering in a world that is so deeply divided as red and blue. I'm not naive enough to say that we as Christians have not navigated difficult, controversial issues through all of our life, but there is a backdrop that I have perceived that doesn't come from within the church. I think it comes from outside the church. But Reinhold Niebuhr wrote a famous book in the, in the, uh, the, the last century, the 20th century. I can't believe that was the last century. In the... In the 20th century about Christ and culture and he said you know churches have a decision to make are they going to reform culture are they going to lead culture or are they going to resemble the culture and I think sadly what's happened in so much of our churches is that we have come to resemble the culture now interestingly this can be used as an argument on two sides of the questions we're asking well you're resembling culture because pastor you're doing away with the Bible and so you're becoming too permissive and you're just falling into line with what the culture wants to do And I would say, no, I think we're resembling the culture because we have encamped in red and blue states and we presume answers to questions before they're asked and we look for one another for code words. I intentionally call this presentation somewhere under the rainbow because the rainbow image itself has become politicized. I know somebody who wore a rainbow scarf to a church meeting because they loved rainbows and they were confronted at the meeting about their beliefs. There is a blue and red nature of our culture that I believe would make Jesus weep. And when I say this, I'm not talking about the Cargill United Methodist Church specifically. I'm talking about what I experience among people of faith There are conservative United Methodists, there are liberal United Methodists, there are people in the middle, and there are those who are off the charts at both extremes. I think we have used the word liberal and conservative as some sort of a shorthand way to pigeonhole people, to either say they're against me or they're for me. John Wesley didn't live in this sort of blue-red environment, but he did counsel Christians of a universal spirit to show love to all. He said... Do you show your love by your works while you have time, as you have opportunity? Do you, in fact, do good to all, neighbors or strangers, friends or enemies, good or bad? Do you do them all the good that you can? You know, sometime back in the 20th century, people said, I don't really know what United Methodists believe because they seem to be all over the map. Well, here's the thing. Methodism has always sought a middle way. Via media is the Latin, the middle way. Wesleyan Methodism was a bridge between the Catholics on one side and the Anglicans over here and the, 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 um, the Calvinists over here, and that's a whole other conversation if you want to have that one. We need to each other bring the gift of balance that God seems to have given United Methodism. And I will say this. And I'm not just saying it because you're here tonight. I believe that Cargill United Methodist Church has this gift, and if I didn't believe that, we wouldn't be having this conversation. We need to bring each other the gift of balance that God has seemingly given to United Methodism. We balance faith and works. We balance justification and sanctification. We balance the word and the sacrament. We balance personal holiness and social holiness. We balance liturgical worship and a more relaxed form of worship. We balance personal piety and social justice. This is who we are as United Methodists. And I have a strong sense that that's who we are as the Cargill United Methodist Church. So I want us to contemplate this phrase, beloved community. I didn't make this one up. Our bishop, Bishop Hsu Jung, has worked for the last three or four years with a focus on racial reconciliation and radical hospitality. 
And admittedly, this was, this was prompted originally by the deep racial divisions that we were experiencing, uh, well, we've always been experiencing, but that resulted in so much of the conflagration and conflict that we experienced in 2020 and, and thereafter. But those of us working in this field have realized that beloved community knows not a single cause or an issue. It's not about color. It's not about sexual orientation. It's not about class. It's not about status. It's about all of it. Because beloved community doesn't put a criteria on the person who walks, the next person who walks that door entering into beloved community. So, This is a working mission statement of Beloved Community. To build an inclusive community of belonging rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ and affirming the sacred worth of every person motivated by kindness, compassion, and love for all life inside and outside of our doors. How does that fall upon your ears and heart? Now, this is a work in progress, and here's the next part of it. We live into beloved community, and there's three things that it says. Here's the first one. I know you can't read this either. We live into beloved community by affirming the full participation of all genders, sexual orientations, races, cultures, classes, abilities, ages, and nationalities in reclaiming reviving and renewing our UMC mission. What is our United Methodist mission? Anybody know? To make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. The ask of that first action step is to affirm the full participation of all people. It doesn't tell me how to vote. It doesn't tell me who to marry. It affirms the full participation as a starting point. Here's the second thing. We live in a beloved community by educating and empowering disciples engaged in the work of justice, reconciliation, and liberation for all people. In many ways here at Cargill United Methodist Church through our Mercy and Justice Ministries, we have attempted to do this very thing. Educate and empower disciples engaged in the work of mercy and justice is how I would put that. That's how I would adapt that for the Cargill Church because that's already who this identity... Your congregation has been working in mercy ministries, which we've called mission and outreach, for decades. Irrespective of the recipients of that mercy, right? When we do mercy, when we reach out to other people, we don't have a criteria of their acceptance. We don't say, well, we'll give you this, but you've got to come to church. We hope they come to church. We'll give you this, but you have to sign off on this belief statement. We don't do that. We do it for the cause of mercy and justice. Micah 6, 8 to do justice, to love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. I think the walk, walk, walk humbly is the biggest challenge for all of us, myself included. The third and last part of we live in a beloved community by resolving conflict with a renewed sense of purpose and hope, drawing on the strength of our unity and our diversity. I don't want to serve a church where everybody's the same. but I do want to be a part of a church that, that loves all people to the, to the limit of its capacity to love. We all have different capacities, right? To live in a church that loves at its capacity to love. So what is the ask this evening? Well, the ask is really not really an ask. I guess it's an invitation to contemplation. I'm not putting before you a proposal, a statement to approve. I'm trying to bring the parking lot conversations inside as God's people 
We've largely sat on the sidelines as we have watched the disaffiliation process take place in the last three years in our denomination and in our conference, and it's been painful. We've lost friends. We as pastors have lost colleagues. We've lost some people who we were in collaborative ministry with who we are no longer in collaboration with. It's always painful when we separate. But who are we called to be? We could do nothing. We could simply maintain the status quo and pray and hope that people will find us and when they do find us, that they will find us to be at a welcoming, open, and affirming place. Or, I would suggest, we can pray on what it means to live into beloved community And if we, if we chose to make such a statement and we shared such a statement so that prospective people who come to our church would read that statement, they would not know that we're perfect. They would not know that we're all of one mind. They would not know that we all vote the same way. They would not be able to tell through coded language whether they're walking into a blue church or a red church, a liberal church or a conservative church. But if we were to make such a statement we would be welcoming into what we hope and believe is beloved community for all. So that's an open-ended question I'll leave with you this evening. There'll probably be some follow-up, perhaps through email, perhaps through other conversation. Um, But I wanted to share on my heart of what many folks I know at Cargill have been talking about for probably for many years, um, in order that God might grace us with the presence of the Spirit to have the conversation this evening. In order to make it a a conversation and not just a monologue, uh, I've got two microphones here, and uh, I've got a couple volunteers, I think, who are willing on one side or another, whoever would like to help take the microphones around. I want you to know that at this point, uh, we are no longer recording anything that is said here, um, and... um, So we're here among friends. So I I open it up to uh, questions, comments, probably not sermons, but questions and comments, reactions. I open it up to the movement of the Spirit in our midst.